Well, hello, everyone. It's May. And I know what May is, is a lot of people are graduating across the United States with degrees in social work from the baccalaureate level to the master's level to the DSW level, PhD level. And NASW just wants to, as president, take this time and say, congratulations. We need you. Look out the window and you see that the world is in desperate need of wonderful social workers. So um, congratulations on getting that degree. Stay committed to social work. It has some barriers and hurdles, but it is a wonderful profession. And we're going to talk about one facet of that profession today. But congratulations, everyone. And congratulations, faculty, staff, administrators who helped you get that far. Um, the world is now your oyster. And one day, one of you will be sitting in my chair as NASW president. Um, so hopefully you will maintain your membership. If you're not a member, you will join. This is your professional association. So please join NASW, but don't just join. Bring your voice to the table because your voice needs to be heard. There are committees on the state level, there's committees on the national level. We're one association, so it doesn't matter whether you're at the state or national, we're one association. All the work that we do, we do together. So please stay and, and when things get tough or that you wonder, what am I getting from my membership? Ask us and we'll let you know. And this is one of the things that we did give for our members is an essential chat. Um, and we decided to go out on the airways and not charge anybody um, because we thought it was important for non-members uh, of NASW to see the importance and understand the various facets of social work. It is just not your traditional facets. And today we're going to talk a little bit about something different. But you all know that um, throughout the time we launched these essential chats, we always had songs, that are, lyrics that I, I kind of read. And this one belongs to Andrea Day, Rise Up, because not only are we talking about the individuals that we work with and work for, we're talking about ourselves as social workers rising up. You're broken down and tired of living life on a merry-go-round. And you can't find the fighter, but I see we're going to walk it out. We just keep going. And move mountains. We're going to walk it out and move mountains. And that's what social workers do. Social workers break barriers. They move mountains. They believe in social justice. Another paragraph says, when the silence isn't quiet and it feels like it's getting harder to breathe, and I know you feel like dying, but I promise we'll take the world to its feet and move mountains and bring it to its feet and move mountains. Think about kids who are in the child welfare system who are being abused or kids or, or, or mothers and fathers where domestic violence is occurring. Family violence is something now that a lot of people must endure. And it gets hard to take that in, especially when you've lost so many people to violence. But we've got to walk it out and move mountains, social workers. We just can't sit there on the sidelines and say, oh, wow, that's a horrible story that made the headlines today. It's a horrible story that made the headlines today, but what are you going to do so it's not a headline tomorrow? And finally, what I would like to say all we need, all we need is hope. And I'm going to add the word action. And for that, we have each other. And for that, we have each other. We will rise up. We will rise. Oh, how we will rise. Our society today is plagued with so many issues that social work must build coalitions with all of the groups that are out there. We can't do it alone but we can do it together. And with our collective voice, we can be a powerful force to make this country live up to what it said it was going to do and bend that arc of justice towards equity for all. 
Now, my guest that I have today was someone that I greatly admire, and her name is Deb Song. So, Deb, if you could come on, um, we'll bring you right up here. And she was the NASW executive director, but she's a new executive director. And um, that's not to say that she did not enjoy the job that she was doing, but she moved mountains. She saw something that needed to be addressed. And she made that commitment to move mountains and go into a field that social workers generally are not seen in. Now, when we first had the first essential sh uh, chat, Deb, it was on child welfare, right? It, you know, we, we brought on Steve Pemberton, whose book is A Chance in the World. Steve Pemberton, as we all know, was a young kid that was brought into care in the middle of the night. Um, didn't know where he was going and was placed in two, was placed in many foster homes, but the two that he lived in the most, he was abused beyond belief. And he actually ran away from the last uh, foster home for fear that he, the foster father was going to beat him and kill him. But in Steve, all of that that Steve talks about, talks about the trauma of child welfare, but he also realizes if he had stayed home, he probably wouldn't have survived either. So as we're going to talk a little bit, and, and this will come up, about a lot of the issues that are out there that social workers are confronting um, and have to be smarter about. Because when I started off, I was in child welfare. I mean, that was my first job. Got out of graduate school, undergrad, went in to child welfare, got a job, then Went back to school to get my master's, came back and headed up the child abuse unit and became legal liaison. But I started off as a child protective service worker. And Deb, I think I shared this with you. I, um, my very, one of, one of the cases that I will always remember because it hurt me as a social worker um, was when I had to bring my first kid in. It was a court order that we had to go out and bring this child into foster care on a, and then have a hearing 72 hours later. But I thought that the child would get to see their parents, right? So we, in the middle of the night again, we pick up the child, we take them to a foster home and foster homes at that time, you know, not telling my age, but had crazy rules that you call me mom, just call me mom. And I kind of looked at the foster mother like, whoa, I couldn't call anybody mom, but my mom, right? You know, there were these rules. And the child, of course, you know, when you remove a child, the child becomes attached to you, right? Because you're the person that, the, so now you're my trusted person. I got to leave this child in the, in the space of a couple of hours with someone else. So um, I told the child, I'll be back tomorrow. You know, we'll be okay. So I went in the agency the next morning and I said, I, you know, I'm going to pick up the, I want to pick up the parents so that the child can see her parents at, at um, the child welfare agency. And my supervisor blew a gasket. You're going to do what? You can't do that. And I'm like, what do you mean? That goes against the policies. The policy is that we give a child 30 days for a honeymoon period you know, to adjust to their new foster home. And if that's disruptive, it's too confusing. And I'm like, 30 days? If you took me from my mom and dad and I had to wait 30 days, I would think my parents had died and had abandoned me or I did something really, really wrong. Now, I wasn't able to change that child's life. But I remember telling my supervisor, I'm going to go do some research on this. And I did. I went to uh, the agency, um, you know, you had a monthly meeting of all of the different departments. And I went and presented my position with facts to bake, break it up to say that this is not right, that we've got to change this rule. Yes, I can understand supervised, um, you know, visitation, but you're hurting kids. And I got that rule changed. And that's when I knew the power of myself as a social worker. I had to go up against my supervisor, the department head, all the established people that just did with the status quo. But if you do your work right, 
Remember, you repre I, I felt like I represented that child. I was that child's advocate, that connection to the world. I just can't live into some of the, the bureaucracy that they had at that particular time. And I kept my job. And in fact, they kept hiring me and putting me in higher jobs because I would speak up. And that's what we have to do. So I want our listening audience today, whether you're in child welfare or whether you have questions about child welfare or you're in domestic violence and working with people who have been abused, to ask us questions, to ask us questions of how do I go up against this system? Now, I want Deb to introduce herself because she's doing a new phase of social work where maybe one day in your state, you can be Deb Song. Go ahead, Deb. Thank you, President Joyner. Uh, my name is Deborah Sun. I'm uh, sh uh, she, her pronouns, and I'm actually the executive director with the Family Violence Appellate Project. I'm about uh, three months into my new job. It's very, very, very new. Um, and I'm very excited to, to just be here with you today, not only to talk about the work, but to talk about and lift up the ways in which social workers can have a presence in these types of matters and advocating really within systems that are largely oppressive. And we know that uh, judicial systems are oftentimes uh, not the most supportive spaces. Um, and, uh, you know, what our organization does is we leverage the systems against themselves. Um, and so for those of you who are familiar, and I'm not sure what the makeup of the current audience is, um, you, you might be familiar with the family violence world, you might be familiar with child welfare services, but um, regardless of whether or not you live in both and or one of those spaces, um, you know, you're, you're likely interfacing with the courts in some fashion. Um, and a lot of times folks in, uh, in these spaces are, have limited understanding of what the appellate process means. And so I'm here to talk a little bit more about that and, and the uh, relevant resources in relation to appellate work. Um, but not only that, there's, uh, there's a lot of work to be done also uh, in terms of prevention so that folks, um, our clients, the people we serve, our communities don't end up having to need appellate services uh, and much less uh, trial court services. Um, and so there, there's a learning opportunity there too, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, I used to be the executive director with National Association Social Workers California chapter. I was there for a few years um, and, and really I miss it and I miss being with my social workers and uh, I'm, I'm so, so, so glad to be here with you all today to really lift up and articulate uh, how social workers can, can make um, a a stronger presence in the legal field because I think we absolutely do have the skill sets um, and the knowledge and the expertise to really make some impact in the policy and, and legal aid world. Uh, so thank you, President Joyner, for having me. Oh, this is my, you're doing us a favor. So thank you because you're showing us another facet of the world of social work and what we can do. So we asked our listening audience to put, put their name in where they're from. I see Tracy Cooper is coming from Orlando, Florida. So hello, Tracy. And then I see Adrian. And now I see Kelly from Toledo, Ohio. Um, think about some questions. Oh, look at you. I don't want to say all of these. Let, uh, Lynetta Luana from Florida. Florida is here, highly represented. I know. Uh, here comes North Carolina. So continue to do that. But then add some questions that you may want to ask. I mean, I saw states of Florida and um, right now in Florida, some kids are being removed uh, from their families because of LGBT, because of DeSantos' new rules. And um, some are being for some parents are being stripped of their power to make decisions for their children. And so what do we do when we have a Ron DeSantos that all of a sudden writes a, a, a bogus law that takes the power of uh, families who are caring and loving their child, strips it and says, you got to go into the system. So first, I want you, Deb, to kind of explain to people what the appellate process is, because we hear it a lot. Everybody says, oh, we have the right to appeal. We have the right to appeal. You know, you, you get a, a ticket. You have the right to appeal. But when you read the entire process, you're like, oh, dang, I'll just let, the, let it go. Um, <laughs> but when somebody removes your child and, you know, the judge says, of course, you have the right to appeal, uh, appeal this decision. Really? How much money is it going to take? 
Yeah. Really? How do I start that? Because could you tell people about that appeal process and what it means? Yeah, and I think that, that was a great way to preface it, Mitt, because I think, uh, first of all, I think the term in and of itself feels intimidating. It, mm -hmm. it feels um, undoable. It oftentimes feels like more hassle than it's worth. So you think about, yeah, a speeding ticket that you get and you have a right to appeal. is, And, you know, because of our conditioning and our exposure to systems who are largely unsupportive, our visceral reaction is, is that actually going to work? me, one person, one human being up against this big system, whether it's, you know, you coming in uh, in front of a judge and uh, contesting something that a law enforcement officer says was true. Uh, that feels intimidating. It's, it feels like something off of, you know, a TV show where you're seeing, you know, people standing up at, at a podium and essentially, you know, sharing some of your vulnerable experiences and then asking someone to judge you on the validity and merit of your statements. That sounds utterly awful. And so I think I wanna uh, start with, um, you know, just grounding in the fact that that is what we have been messaged all of our lives, that, um, that these systems are oftentimes not uh, built to provide us with that security and ability and sense of safety that our rights are truly our rights. Um, so, you know, that colors all of our experiences, right? Whether or not we decide to pursue and challenge a system, uh, whether or not we even have the resources to challenge a system, all of these things. And that's, you know, I, I could go on a, a quite a bit of a tangent around the access to justice piece of it, because um, that that's a piece I think that just gets lost in the mix. We talk about access to behavioral health, access to healthcare. We do not talk about access to justice enough because attorney fees are exorbitant and incredibly, incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so all that to say, you know, I'm, I'm adding that layer to, to just justify that that term in appeal it just has, you know, has this negative connotation to it, um, even though it's essentially what it is offering. It's offering folks a mechanism to challenge. So you can challenge whatever it is that, you know, you've been asked to do, whether it's paying a fine, being accused of, yes, yeah, beating. Um, you can also challenge a judicial decision. So in the context of domestic violence, or can we do civil legal aid? Um, so domestic violence cases can, can be interfacing with a variety of court systems. The, I think, more traditional space that you might be, um, you might have a cognitive association around domestic violence cases is that it's criminal. And so you often think of criminal court. Um, when uh, the domestic violence cases involve intimate relationships, you are also thinking about fam potentially family law court. And if there's a child involved and there's a discussion as to whether or not the child's safety is in jeopardy, then you're also talking about juvenile dependency court. So there's a myriad of spaces that you might be considering in terms of an appeal and the various types of spaces where judicial decisions can impact a survivor's ability to access um, you know, safety and security moving on from that particular incident or a series of incidents. Uh, so essentially what our organization does, so we're based in the state of California. We have a California office in the state of Washington office. We recently expanded just a couple of years ago to the state of Washington, but we do have a presence there and we do have um, two and a half staff there. So we're still in pilot mode, uh, but we're able to take appellate cases there. We largely receive referrals from, um, from legal aid attorneys, but in many cases, survivors themselves might call. Um, and or advocates do. So, you know, we certainly we're, we're open in, in terms of who can refer cases to us. Um, and essentially, you know, what we're taking a look at is whether or not, so here are the two sort of instances that might come up. Uh, and uh, our cases can be related to uh, domestic violence, uh, intimate partner violence, human trafficking, as well as sexual assault. So we recently expanded our mission to actually be more inclusive of all the gender-based violence issues. Um, although we have a specialty area and we're, we're deeply uh, and historically grounded in, in uh, domestic violence matters. Um, so when you're looking at appeals, uh, here are the two sort of scenarios that, that can typically come up is that a judge has made some sort of decision around your case. Um, and again, we do civil legal aid, so I'm not talking about the criminal court case. 
Um, but oftentimes in the context of family law, what we're seeing is that a judge awards some kind of joint custody between the survivor and the abuser. That's actually, unfortunately, a very common one. So um, we're hearing from legal aid attorneys as well as survivors who might want to appeal that decision. So challenge the decision, ask the higher court, which is the appellate court, to reconsider uh, that decision. Um, in juvenile dependency court, what you're looking at is potentially, and I think our social workers might know this process pretty well, is that if a judge makes a decision about removing a child from the home and what that particular uh, condition looks like, so whether it's temporary or um, you know, supervised, all of that. So, uh, so an appellate court is considered a higher level court than the trial courts. And there are three things that an appellate court can do. So the appellate judge can uh, affirm the court, trial court's decision, which is essentially saying, yes, um, I, I agree with it. And we're gonna maintain that uh, judicial decision. They can reverse uh, the case and so, or the decision, excuse me, and have um, the trial court uh, essentially facilitate a new, brand new trial. Um, or they can remand the case, which is uh, asking the trial court to retry the case. Um, and so they have the authority to make that decision. And it's uh, the way that the experience is essentially structured is that, so if you're, for instance, a social worker for a survivor of domestic violence, um, you might be able to articulate the experience that it's not going, it's not like you're going to another trial. Um, you're not gonna go through testimonies, you know, uh, depositions, all of that. You're not gonna do that again. But what the appellate judge is going to be taking a look at is all the evidence. They're gonna be reviewing everything on paper and at the appellate process, and this is so, so, so incredibly important for social workers to realize, and all providers of care is that if it's not documented, it didn't, it didn't happen. And mm -hmm. it and it there's no record of it for because that's all that's all that the appellate judge is looking at. Any documentation. There is no new testimony, there is no new evidence, there's none of that. So they're purely looking at uh, court reporter notes. They're looking at the evidence, everything that was essentially brought to uh, brought to fruition during the trial court proceeding. Um, and then based upon that, uh, the attorneys that are um, uh, representing the their clients, so they're going to be bringing uh, forth or they're going to develop their brief. So that's essentially your argument for or against. So the other bucket I mentioned, oftentimes it's the survivors or you know they're repealing a particular um, judgment that was made. The other sort of scenario that we uh, oftentimes see is that the abuser is um, the one that's appealing the judicial case. So maybe they feel they they were treated unfairly and that the judgment did not err on their uh, side, and so they're appealing the case. So then we're uh, we're defending the uh, and representing the survivor against the appeal. So it's either for the appeal or mm -hmm. against the appeal. So those are the sort of the two uh, sort of scenarios that we tend to see. Um, because, uh, and I'm naming this because this is, you know, important, not just in the sense of when you're providing your services, obviously you're documenting and, you know, documentation, we all know that uh, can, um, can go, you know, into the court process. Um, and, all of that is so incredibly powerful. And I, you know, we, we hear about it in our social work training in, in making sure that we're articulating as objective uh, an assessment as possible. And in the appellate court process, this is so incredibly important because it's all that the judges read. So mm -hmm. for instance, if you are representing, you know, um, a, a child and you're trying to describe what the uh, survivor of crime is experiencing in that moment and say the language is not objective, say it's subjective and it describes the person as being erratic, overly emotional, um, you know, uh, volatile, um, as opposed to the more objective term, such as, um, you know, um, Klein's mother is, uh, is sobbing and, uh, you know, is, seems, uh, seems very fatigued, you know, things like that, right? Where where they are tangible and more objective. Like what happens is oftentimes an appellate judge will take a look at more subjective descriptions and actually uh, interpret that as uh, being associated. And, and this is oftentimes because the abuser's representation will make these cases that these are symptoms of somebody who is unstable, who is emotionally erratic, who is, you know, and this is like not from a trauma-informed lens, right? Um, and so if, abusers are going to leverage any information that is documented for their case. And that's, you know, that's the nature of 
the, the court process is that you take the language that's available to you and you argue an interpretation that will err on your favor. And so it's, I, I think what, what we realize as social workers or oftentimes don't realize is, is the power of our words and the trajectory and pipeline. And this is like the entire pipeline of the impact of our documentation. So it's not just in the micro that in that moment, you know, your supervisor is going to re uh, review your case notes and it looks good and clinically sound. It's actually, no, it goes to trial. It goes to the appellate process. It, it's there in perpetuity. And it, um, it absolutely, you know, it, it colors and factors into the well-being of this family for, you know, the rest of their lives, potentially. And so I think, I think these are things that social workers know. I think, you know, I right. think they're trained, but I, I, I don't know that, you know, I certainly, until I started doing this work even more deeply, I don't think I realized, you know, how, um, how much beyond the trial court process that this, this language can be leveraged and oftentimes for for not good so for yeah for, right. for the purposes of of defending somebody you know who who uh you know is the abuser in this case um so yeah i'll pause there well you you said a, a whole lot um <laughs> i i taught a social worker in a law course and and you know i was surprised that a lot of people did not know the difference between civil court Mm -hmm. um, and did not know the various layers of civil court. You know, um, they really kind of looked at it as criminal court. I was surprised and, and really kind of worked with people in my agency or in, in children and youth to take 15 minutes after each visit and do your notes because a judge does not want to hear, I do your notes every third Friday. Everything will get thrown out, you know, everything will get thrown out because how do you, how can you recollect what you wore yesterday, right? Let alone. So it's really important. And I would always say, just get in your car or just go to your office. Map that, that space is more important because you have to, it's the business record act, right? That we have to be able to say that, yes, they were done in a timely manner. And you're so right about descriptive words, like a descriptive word, the how, when, when you're going in and there's a gross physical neglect case, so to speak, and you say the house was dirty. Well, what's dirty to you and what's dirty to the judge is two entirely different. What you have to say is that there was feces on the floor. There was urine um, everywhere. You have to let and build, let that person build the picture, right? right? Rather than to sum it up because you could be a person that's just, you know, doesn't like dirt, right? And so right. Um, the whole thing is, and, and it is hard for social workers sometimes, I think, to talk in descriptive language without judgment, right? Uh, what you want to yeah. be able to do is to do that without judgment. And you're right, Deb, you know, the, the part that you say is, this is not the micro level. This is going to impact the meso and the macro level right, in taking your notes, getting them done in a timely process, because when you go through that appeal process, what is going is the briefs, the two yeah. briefs on both sides, yeah. and you're having a panel of judges look at that material and then decide whether, okay, we're going to stand with what was there, or we're going to send it back, um, uh, and, and, and it's so important for you to kind of understand your role as a social worker. So the appellate process is one that we don't always think about. And even the role of the guardian ad litem in the appellate process is, is real important and critical to kind of look at. But what, what Deb said is it costs. You know, yeah. um, if you don't build... And, and so, Deb, what you what you honestly say, I don't care what child welfare office you represent, you need to carry yourself down to legal aid and not with a not with a case and meet some people and go to lunch with some people who have advocacy in mind. You, you, you got to be able to call on the right people, right, to be able to say, I have a case and I'm really going to need you at this particular, same way with the prosecutor's office. You've got to be able to find a prosecutor that, oh, wow. And the same way with the judge, 
you know, it's nothing to judge shop to figure out what judge is going to be here in family court this week. Uh, I'm going to sit this out this week and I would rather be scheduled for next week. Those are the roles of social workers trying to understand how these systems integrate and, and, and on each other, right? Um, not that you're going to build the perfect case, but once once you give your facts without judgment, non-judgment approach to social work, um, you will allow somebody to say, wow, okay, um, the father, the father really can't have custody of this child. You know, even though, um, and I hate doing that bias, I should say mother sometimes. And, I, and so, you know, I apologize for that uh, because there's some great dads out there because sometimes we just assume that the mother um, should have custody of the child. So I do want to say that first and foremost. Um, I've read too much from the Father Initiative Project to kind of say how we're kind of biased. But uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that w when those things happen, you know, it, it's really nice to be able to say, well, we're going to have split custody. Really? Really? You know, I'm here because I'm saying this person's abusive to me and my child. And now you're going to split that time? Um, and my child's not going to want to go. And if I don't want to go and I don't send them, then I violated an order. If I violated an order, I could end up losing my rights. All of those things. Now, Deb had said about how important it is for social workers to know this stuff, but to also educate others, right? To educate the people that you serve. Look, this is this is what you can do. These are, you know, I'm not for one side or the other, but I want you to know what the appeal process entails. It's rigorous. It's tough. I got a legal aid attorney over here that I think will will go here. Um, now, I want to hear a little bit more about your pro bono attorneys. You know, pro bono attorneys, sometimes we tend to think, oh, they're not going to be good. But usually pro bono attorneys come from the top law firms where they can afford to let some of their attorneys and do the work in a certain area so that people get skills. So tell us a little bit about that, Deb, because I know you work with pro bono attorneys. We do, and I apologize. My dog's barking in the background. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. Right. Um, <laughs> he, he's agreeing uh, with me. I know you're agreeing. What's the dog's name? Raspberry. Raspberry. <laughs> I know you hear me. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, what's interesting, and I've learned this because, you know, now I'm running a legal aid organization, is that um, attorneys, uh, and, you know, I apologize if I'm misquoting this, they are encouraged through um, through their code of ethics to actually dedicate um, our super bono time as, as a mechanism for them to give back to the community. Um, and so oftentimes you have um, uh, large firms uh, who have pro bono managers who actually have an arm that supports their employees who are seeking ways to give back to the community. Um, our organization, because we're a State Bar of California recognized support center, we actually um, in the state of California, and this is probably applicable to, to a lot of states, we maintain a directory um, from our State Bar uh, where pro bono attorneys or attorneys who want to do pro bono work can actually look up what opportunities exist. Uh, and so um, we, we essentially, because we're statewide, you know, we're accessible to uh, attorneys looking for pro bono work, regardless of what part of the state you're in. Um, but you have the ability to uh, select, you know, what type of issue area as, you know, well as how pro bono attorneys can participate. Um, what it looks like for us, and that's usually how they find us. Oh, the other thing I will say is that, um, you know, word of mouth. If people have a good experience with you, uh, working with your organization, oftentimes that that is also a mechanism to uh, getting connected to more pro bono attorneys. Um, because attorneys talk just like social workers talk, um, you know, and, and look for positive experiences around um, doing their volunteer service work. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so those are the ways in which they access the way that it actually looks like in practice, because we are a legal aid agency, we have about uh, eight to nine staff attorneys, and they actually work oftentimes in co-counsel. 
So uh, it's in collaboration. Um, and so uh, it, this could look like a variety of ways, depending on what you're looking at. Um, in some cases, we're working with skilled uh, attorneys who um, will facilitate a moot court. So essentially, you're mimicking the appellate process, right? You're presenting your brief, you're giving your oral argument, and you're, uh, it's kind of like... Um, uh, when we uh, when we mimic our therapeutic sessions, right? When we uh, go through a, a scenario, case scenario, we all love those, um, and role play through uh, through our case scenarios. That's essentially what a moot court is for for our attorneys, and so that might be a way to partner with a pro bono attorney. Another way is actually in the research and the brief um, development. So obviously, in order for us to understand the nuances of a case, we also have to read everything involved, um, and that takes probably the most amount of time uh, and uh, oftentimes we're working with co-counsel to review all the relevant trial court uh, materials um, and to find potential errors that the judge made. Um, and then there's the actual brief writing process itself, which is the argument, the argument that gets submitted to the appellate judge uh, that says, hey, here's the error that this trial court judge made and here's why we want it, you know, we want it fixed. Um, so, and then the oral argument is preparing the, um, you know, oral delivery of that argument. So those are the various steps in which our co-counsel might be supporting us. Um, it, sometimes our co-counsel might be giving the oral argument. Sometimes we are, oftentimes we're the ones because we are um, a specialty legal aid agency in the appellate world. Um, and the only one in the states of California and Washington, we, we have specialty um, uh, expertise areas in family law. Um, as well as related law. And so um, many of the times we're the ones providing coaching and technical assistance to co-counsel. And so that that's another big piece of it too, that you make sure that you're partnering with folks who have the subject matter expertise so that um, you can move forward in a judicious way. Um, I, I would say with uh, social service type of entities um, that, you know, you often have to have organizational buy-in to participate in this type of work because you're essentially signing on to legal aid services or legal aid support. So, you know, it's it's something that an organization has to make a decision around whether or not they want to prioritize it. Um, I know NASW also has resources that I think a lot of social workers should be privy to. Um, and it's something that I think our field just hasn't leveraged enough. And, and I, I think because people are, again, it's, it's an intimidating idea about thinking uh, to appeal something. And you can oftentimes appeal termination. Social workers can appeal in you know, the decisions around whether or not you were terminated from a particular position due to whatever in you know, a situation. Um, and in, in some cases, unfortunately, we've seen that social workers are terminated for wrongful cause. Um, so there are a myriad of ways that I think pro bono attorneys could be useful for us. Um, and like if you're leading an organization, they're oftentimes used to review, you know, handbook policies or HR policies, employment policies, that sort of thing. And so there's a myriad of types of attorneys, too, that I think, you know, social workers who would benefit from understanding like labor attorneys um, uh, in terms of what's relevant to their particular need. Oh, you're on mute, Mitt. Yes, I had to take a swallow of something. I didn't want everybody in the world to hear me swallow. Um, one of my dreams as NASW president, and I, I'll be wrapping it up at the end of uh, June, is that we use our legal defense fund and build pro bono attorneys because we have social workers now that are being terminated for um, talking to someone about an abortion or telling them what state they can go to. I talked to one social worker I knew um, in Iowa who decided they had to leave their job after many, many years because the school system was requiring that if a child was not identifying their sex by their birth certificate, the social worker had to report that. And she said, I, I can't do that. You know, that's, that's not. So are you going to support social workers for being civilly disobedient? Because I just can't do that as a social worker. It goes against my code of ethics to be able to do something like that. And of course, the, you know, the school kind of waffled. I don't know. Are you going to provide liability insurance for us? I, well, let's see. And her thing was, well, I have to leave. 
You know, and the one thing I tell all social workers, you need to know when to leave a job, right? You, whether, if the job's taking you against that code of ethics, you'll find another job, but but get out of there. So I, I was uh, really, really uh, happy that she did that. But in the meantime, I wish I could have given her an attorney that NASW could have said here in Iowa, we have these attorneys that you can go to and they will fight this case. Now, everybody out there in social work knows somebody that knows somebody. Right. And so if we have 55 chapters, we should be able to use our resources and our networks to identify social workers in every state in the United States that would do some pro bono work for us. And let's just say we only get two in every state. I mean, I, but that's a hundred and something social workers, right? If we collectively put them on with their area of expertise. I, my vision is, you know, if anybody ha happened to follow the civil rights movement, it was the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And that is what got uh, Brown versus Board of Education. That's what Thurgood Marshall was involved in. Many, many leaders were involved in and received at that time small amounts of money, but they were all working for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And we also have the Southern Poverty Law Center that kind of does the same thing. Shouldn't we have a social NASW, a legal defense fund for social justice? Um, isn't that something that isn't achievable? It's, it's, it, it, you know, doesn't take a whole lot of money. It takes a whole lot of being able to go out and say, this is in your, your ethics as well. And these are some of the things that we're up against because let's face it, a lot of the attorneys want to work in family law. They want to, they want to develop their skills for billable hours, right? They want to be able to hear the cases and to understand the people. So, we're going to work in that area. So, you know, I kind of talk with the board chair who is very interested in um, taking that back to the committee members on Legal Defense Fund. But if out there in the listening world, you know of some attorneys or some firms that we should approach, please let us know. It all starts with that first step. Remember, rise up. You got to rise up from somewhere, right? So what I'd like some of you to do now is to give us your questions. Um, to, to tell us like, wow, what you're thinking. Deb is in a world, Deborah's in a world now where there's not a lot of social workers. And I'm, and I'm sure you didn't think that you would be there. So Luan has, how do we handle the aging out process so kids can be more accessible? Thank you, Luana, for this question. Aging out. Deb, you want to take, start that? Yeah, and it's it's a it's a big question with a big answer and every state looks radically different. Mm -hmm. And so I'm fortunate that I'm my organization works out of two states that are probably better positioned than many in terms of our laws. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the the simple answer would be that laws need to change, simply mm -hmm. put resources need to be invested. We cannot expect somebody to age out of a system with zero resources or minimal resources. And I think this is uh, this is an area where there is a clear case for uh, like a no holds bar, you know, access to resources. And I, and I mean, you know, job, uh, you know, uh, public benefits, um, healthcare, um, you know, edu higher education, all of that, we need to have government step up. I, I mean, simply put, and, you know, California has done a lot of work around that. Um, and, uh, and I think other states need to too. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it, it shouldn't be, um, you know, it shouldn't be highly regulated in the sense that, you know, government is tracking a certain level of efficacy, you know, for this child or youth to, to achieve. The reality is that, is that a system, um, a system needs to provide adequate steps for transitioning out of its system support. Right. In order for that to happen, you have to have uh, the freedom of access to resources. And what I mean by that is the more regulation that you put on particular access to resources, the less likely that person is going to be engaged and continue with those resources. And so if you say that you have to use your educational stipend for X, Y, and Z, as opposed to like a, a trade school or something else that they want to do, maybe they don't even want to go to college, but they do want to work in you know, a profession that doesn't require a college degree. Could that education stipend be applied to, you know, ongoing learning about that particular profession, not necessarily in a structured environment. So all that to say, I think I, I mean, I honestly think the government needs to put up 
money, um, you know, and and uh, respond to all these various facets that a youth is going to need support uh, and mental health support as well. We can't have them just, uh, you know, assume that because they're on the Medicaid system, oh, yeah, they have access to behavioral health. Actually, no, they need augmented yeah. behavioral health supports um, in this transitional period. And I'm not talking, you know, just 18 to 20. I'm actually talking, no, actually into your mid to late 20s, right. because the systemic um, burden and harm that is caused on individuals, and even if you were just in, in care for a year or two before you age out, it doesn't matter. It's still largely detrimental. So that's to say, I think my simple answer is that government needs to step up, but I know that it's certainly harder to make that case. I do think it's you know an advocacy opportunity for for groups like NASW California to be a part of and to share the story you know from other states or other jurisdictions that have had success with those types of models. I know Anna Casey had been working in that um, and, and has done some phenomenal work in that particular area, helping people, you know, have keep their access to health care, um, access to college. I mean, everybody does it individually. Um, but just can you imagine having to age out at 18? And, and the military should not be the option. Right. You know, because a lot of young people are guided. If, if that's where they choose to go, that's one thing. But this is what we mean about equity. If I just choose to at 18, sit home and try to figure out where is my life going, I should have that right. Whether I am in an intact family, single parent family or no family whatsoever. And it adds such a pressure on groups of people. You know, I don't have much hope for government because government. Um, you see what we're going right through right now? I just really don't have, um, I, 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 you know, I, I believe that our democracy is gone and, and it doesn't really care about people. It cares about enriching people. But I, I do believe that there are many people in the for-profit world that um, have lived that life themselves and who's ready to invest in groups of youth to be able to help them through that system. See, that's where I think that social workers have to think a little bit differently. Like, wow, you know, when you look at some of, um, and, you know, here you all say, here she goes to sports again. But when I look at some people in sports and the life that they live and that the dollars that they have now, they invest back. You know, um, I'm not a AD fan, you know, um, but I do know that he was raised in uh, Prince Georgia County and he put a lot of money into the youth with boys and girls clubs and different ways that we can help individuals have equity and have the right and the ability to make choices. And so, Luana, I don't think that what we're saying is we don't have the perfect answer, but um, we do know that everybody has the right to be able to make choices, whether they're 18 or 17 or 19. And how can we assist maybe with some programs through the federal government? But the reason why I say that about government is because it depends on where the money goes and how it gets drifted out and, and um, usually it gets eaten up. But, 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 the thing that that we do know is many people have walked that life of having to age out or be on their own. Heck, my mother, my father's mother died um, and my other uncle had to literally quit high school so they could take care of my dad. That's just the way things were done. So so families, if you look at it through the cultural lens, families have done that for a long period of time. It's, it's just that the system never sanctioned it, right? Never sanctioned a cousin raising someone or, um, you know, raising, getting out of that traditional child welfare area. But where else could we boister people? So, Luana, that's an excellent question. And I hope that that's an area that you're going to work on. Don't give up. Rise up and, and, and talk with some youth who have, are aging out, have aged out and get their concerns because that's what makes impact. So uh, thank you for that. We have another question. All right, Kaylin wants to know, will we be talking about parental alienation and reunification camps? Mm -hmm. 
It looks like there's a second question. Yeah, and the second one, do you believe a child or children should be taken away from their safe parent, go through a uni reunification camp to reunify with their abuser? Yeah, and I guess those questions that have overlap, and that's why they were sort of mm -hmm. um, thrust that's together. That's from Cassandra, yeah. Yeah, great questions. I mean, parental alienation, it comes up. It, absolutely. People people use that as a descriptor to um, uh, to describe ways in which a particular parent might have um, harmed the child uh, um, and, you know, essentially using the child as a, a you know, a leverage, um, uh, you know, convincing the child or uh, of like negative attributes of the other parent or something to that effect. Um, so in these cases, yes, I, I'm the short answer is that, yes, it comes up. Um, I think the ways in which, um, and this, I have to say, this also comes up very differently in the state of California, let alone the state of Washington, as well as other states. I would say in the state of California, um, you know, the trend has moved away from utilizing that term. Um, but I, I, I don't think that's the case uh, nationally, nor I, would I say that that's the case in majority of the states. Um, so this is, again, where the social work intervention is huge. Um, you know, the, the assessments that you all do on the ground, the engagement that you have with all parties, um, whether, you know, irrespective of who, you know, who is arguing what, um, it, it's so pivotal to the ways in which things are going to be interpreted as conditions such as parental alienation. Um, and so, you know, earlier I was talking about how your words are crucial, you know, in the ways that you document and articulate a particular um, uh, condition uh, that the child is experiencing. I think, I think we have to, and, and this is the unfortunate case, and I think in, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to think this way, is that we always have to remember that our words might fall into the wrong hands. Um, and if there is room for interpretation uh, based upon our assessment and our documentation that uh, someone is um, utilizing, you know, alienation as a tactic, um, then we have to be we have to understand that. Um, and I think um, there also needs to be more social work research around it, too. And I think that's an area, you know, certainly. I would call in social work researchers around as well, um, because unfortunately the term and the concept hasn't gone away, but I think there's a lot of room for conversation around what this actually looks like in practice um, and how, um, and what are the ramifications, you know, the, the behavioral health ramifications as well as the, the legal ramifications. Um, and I think, um, I think, yeah, like I mentioned in the state of California, we don't see it as frequently, but I, I think it's, uh, unfortunately, similar to reunification camps, it's a concept that's still around. Um, you know, in terms of whether or not I personally would believe uh, that, you know, somebody should be removed from the quote unquote abuser. Um, and I use quotes just because we're talking about sort of a subjective experience. And I don't know this, but, you know, I'm not talking about the details of a specific case. Um, but uh, I, I think the reality is that, you know, from our perspective, if we're representing a case, um, and a client uh, based on particular details of a situation, we're choosing to find merit in the survivor. Like there, there's a reason why we took on the case. We don't take on cases um, because there is a lack of evidence of abuse, or if we don't see evidence that the, um, that the abuse will be perpetuated or continued, then you know, there's merit for us to have that room for conversation about whether or not this case is appropriate for us. The, the reality is that you know, we're not making the case that you know, no family is you know, repairable, that no relationship is repairable. That's absolutely not the case. I, I think uh, what's interesting as I was listening to you, Dr. Joyner, talk about, um, I think it was Steve's case earlier on in the beginning, is that you know, I personally have a case that if systems intervened, my family would not be together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was a child witnessing domestic violence in my own home. And the reality is that we did not have systems intervene. And that was a blessing to us mm -hmm. because we stayed together and my parents stayed together and we're all healthy today. Mm -hmm. um, and, and had any systems intervened, um, it would have been detrimental and had a system intervened and said, you know, my father could not have a positive relationship with me. That would have turned my world upside down. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the reality is that there, there is no way to make a blanketed statement mm -hmm. about any, any situation, whether it's, you know, whether or not somebody should not be reunified or otherwise, I think, you know, the, we have to make case by case judgment calls 
Uh, I think unfortunately in uh, the work that I do uh, is that I, I choose to work within oppressive systems. I choose to work within a system where I have to pick and choose, not me personally, but you know, our staff, our team have to pick and choose which cases to take on and which, you know, we know that they might not, you know, uh, be affirmed by an appellate mm -hmm. judge. Um, and this is, this is a sad point to us, to be honest. And we talk about it as a team that it's sad for us to have that experience where we can't fight for everybody um, because the systems are still flawed, the policies are still flawed. Um, but I think what that that then does for us is, and I think this is the beauty of our organization as well as many others, is that we take that knowledge and then push policy change. We then take that knowledge and push systems change. And I would be remiss if you know we weren't in a position um, if we were in a position where we did nothing, mm -hmm. if we knew that there were systemic failures and kind of just sat on that information, I, you know, I know my heart could not take that. And I think that's oftentimes where social workers are, um, are placed unfairly because when you're in the direct service role, you oftentimes don't have the capacity or bandwidth to, to think about that and to actually apply actionable change. And honestly, I think that's the space for NASW. I right. think that's the space for social workers to be able to, you know, articulate their experiences, uh, anecdotes, it doesn't matter, you know, if it's just the story, because it's never just the story to a space such as NSW, so that then it can inform future systemic and policy changes. Um, these are the ways in which that, you know, individual stories then inform broader systemic uh, changes. But I think there is this bigger conversation for sy systems to create room for individuality. And I don't think systems do that well. Right, right. Um, and so, you know, when we think about reunification and, you know, alienation and all these sort of uh, terms and ideas that, you know, have negative connotations, um, it, you know, the reality is that our systems have used them, uh, you know, in negative ways and that's why. Um, and we have to think about what else. So we have to think about, you know, how can we actually apply positive framing to ways in which families and relationships can potentially heal. And that's a, sort of a new way of, yeah, a new way of thinking and a bigger call to action for those in child welfare. Yeah, I, I always say words matter. So I hate that camp, you know, like alienation. I mean, camp, camping is like going to camp and you, you know, beginning, middles and end and you keep going. It's something that you want to do. So I think social workers, number one, need to understand their role in, um, it's the same way about BIPOC. I hate that word BIPOC because it, it, it is, um, uh, it's, it's, what does it mean? Some people don't know what it means. So, so when you're saying, uh, and, and when the system is talking about camp, you know, alienation, First off, the, the thing that child, the child welfare is really, workers really need to know is you're really following law, case law. It's not your child. It actually is the child that belongs to the system. And unless a child's rights are terminated by the court, you have an obligation to reestablish or to determine whether or not a person can see that parent as good as they are or as bad as they are. Right. And so, you know, that's where your documentation is so important. Um, father didn't show up. Father came in drunk. Um, uh, father came, you know, cursing or whatever to, to be able to do that. I, I would never bring a child even in for a visit with a particular family because they never showed up. So it was easier for me to have them sitting in the agency for a half an hour and go get the child if they showed up. Right. But I also know that there are our, our prisons are overrun with fathers and mothers, and um, they're going to establish a relationship with their child, whether child welfare workers want it or not. Um, and it is important that the court, if you're called to task, you can't say to the court, well, I never scheduled anything or I never talked about that. Um, you know, I, I don't I too do not believe that um, you can alienate a child from their parent, no matter how hard or, or what that parent has done. But I also believe that you don't forcibly make a child have that. If they say, I don't want to see my dad, I don't want to see my mom, then I think you have to work with that and you have to document that. But um, 
be careful when 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 people start to say camp because what they're really trying to say is it's an okay experience right um you wouldn't go to camp unless it was an okay experience and what we do know is no matter what a person goes through uh reunification or alienation it is traumatic it's it is not anything worthy of the word camp um so all right joyce main dhs reunification process explain to why the social workers don't do their job. As a social worker, it isn't our job to support the parents. Well, Joyce, I would agree with that. It is our job to support the child. You know, if the child is in the child welfare agency, that is our job to support the the child. Parents have the right and have hired their own attorney, right? Um, and, and you can talk about that, Deborah. Um, and the guardian ad litem is also there. But um, I, I, you know, it's 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 supportive of the child as it relates to their family. That's what I would say. Deborah, what, what would yours? Yeah, I mean the the whole you know um, notion of whole person care involves the whole person, mm -hmm. every single human being that's colored or touched their lives. You know, our job certainly isn't to, and you know, it's a little bit preaching to the choir here. Our job certainly isn't to judge, you know, um, a person's situation and or judge who they want to have relationships with. Um, it's for us to, you know, support and work in allyship to cultivate the relationships that are safe and supportive um, to individuals. Um, I think, you know, again, like what I was talking about earlier, I think that this gets muddied up with liability and structure and, you know, protocols. And unfortunately, those are the systems that we are oftentimes working within. And it's awful. It's awful that, you know, we're forced to work within the context of pathology. It's awful that we're forced to work in the context of institutions that have a fear of liability rather than safety um, and or just freedom and, and decision making. Um, and it's awful that our systems don't oftentimes support us. Um, you know, if we're trying to make a decision that is more trauma informed rather than based on fear, mm -hmm. um, all of all of these structures are, yeah, are just awful. Um, and, you know, I think it, it makes for this perfect storm that forces social workers to com compartmentalize their priorities. Mm -hmm. So even if, you know, if in a perfect workspace, you know, you might have chosen, you know, to have the, if you had the resources in the space to think, and you didn't have the high caseloads, then you have the time to work more deeply with the child and all the community members involved, all the relatives, the churches, the mosques, the everybody, right? Then you have that luxury. Um, and it is a luxury because it's not something that we're granted to actually think more holistically about, you know, what this looks like. And, and this, these are oftentimes the models that are embraced by the alternative services, mm -hmm. right? Like the folks who are working outside of government entities, the folks that are working to transform first response, all of these systems, right? Um, because it's more grounded in community. Um, I think what's hard for social workers is um, is that you know we we oftentimes choose to work from the inside, and I think that's noble because it's so incredibly hard. Um, and what happens then is that you know you have to at times make compromises um, and pick and choose in that moment. Is it a liability call about that child, and less so about the parents involved? Right. Right. And it's, it's just, it's, yeah, it's a setup for failure. And that, I don't think that's the social worker's fault, but I do think it's the system's fault. Okay, Erica wants to know, how do you combat states that have mandated minimum pa parenting time, but one parent has documented abuse to the child? I mean, it sounds like laws need to be changed. I, I mean, simply put, it, it, it that sounds, I'm not sure where Erica is calling in from. Um, I'm certainly not familiar with uh, when the, with that type of um, mandatory condition, um, but that sounds like a policy change at this, whether it's the state level, organizational level. I think this is a place where also social workers can get more involved is understanding whether it's an organizational or policy level and or, um, you know, if you're able to parse that out, then uh, then you can uh, more clearly articulate your your advocacy position, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when an institution is not implementing a state level policy or regulation um, in appropriately. 
Right. And so um, I, I think that was, I know when I was in direct service, that was where I struggled um, a lot in terms of knowing, am I actually required to do this? Um, or is this my organization deciding that they would rather do this? Mm -hmm. um, that said, yeah, I think, you know, certainly talk to your local chapter about, you know, that, that issue. I think it sounds like there's certainly merit in, you know, changing that policy. Um, but I, I think that's unfortunately the sad reality that in a lot of these situations where there are harmful policies in place, that is a solution that, you right. know, they just need to change. And, and you have to kind of remember from the case that I talked about earlier that a lot of times agencies will interpret their own policies and then make them procedures. So it is really important to yes. say, did the yeah. state really say this or are we really saying this? Yep. And to also have the, um, your organization's attorney help interpret that. Like, do I see it a little bit different. You know, can, I, can, I, can we talk to the attorney? But this is where... You know, I love the, the social work day on the hill. Don't get me wrong. I love them. I love them. I love them. But this is where we take the evidence and go and talk with someone about we need to change this. Um, we, we, you know, this is where you go and you do your homework with I with Kristen Houlihan is in my area. I would go and say, look, look, what, look what we're doing here in Pennsylvania. We need to change this. Um, and, and give them enough evidence so that they can write a bill that will address these issues that can get passed. That's where I firmly believe, you'll always hear me say, no matter where I talk, there's no such thing as micro, meso, and macro. And we put our blinders on like this. It is integrated and infused in everything we do. Um, and so why that frontline worker, why that worker is so important is because sometimes laws are passed way up here and the intention is for good. But by the time it gets to the bottom, you're like, who the heck passed that law? So, yeah. you know, it, it is important for you to validate right down and how it is affecting um the law that you passed and get that changed. Um, and, and a lot of times you will find that there are really good people that write up bills that become laws that just don't make sense when they get down to your level. Um, and that's where the, the, the role of the worker um, and, and these days on the Hill of going collectively about something. I know I, I did California's one time and they were going collectively about certain bills so that everybody wasn't piecemealing things um, that, that you're going collectively. Do any states mandate that CPS workers have access to therapy? I, I Chris, I, I, Carissa. wish I had heard. Yeah, I wish I, I knew of a state. Yeah. And I can't, I've never heard of a state mandating that. I think what would be beautiful would be for an institution, all institutions to offer behavioral health support to all mm -hmm. direct service workers, um, given, you know, how, how difficult uh, and onerous, yeah, these experiences are. Um, I haven't, yeah, I haven't heard of a state that mandates. I haven't, I haven't heard of a uh state that has that. I do think it's the role of the direct supervisor to keep that intact. Um, and, you know, one time we hired a, a worker and he was really good, would go out on case, but then he, he kind of um, told me one day that, you know, he was abused by his father and he was going to make sure that no other kid was ever abused. Well, I couldn't keep him in the child abuse unit anymore. You know, um, I, I, I just couldn't do that. So I think it's important for your direct supervisor, you know, not to be talking about, I mean, it's, it's important to get the logistics down. How many cases do you have? Can you take any more? I mean, some people don't even have supervision anymore. It's, it's called supervision on the run. When you have a problem, you go talk to your super. Mm. But supervision is critical critical in child welfare. And it's kind of critical to talk about the various issues that come up. So Carissa, that's kind of where, I think that's the only thing that, that I see, um, but it has eroded over time because the caseloads are so big and people don't see supervisors as they should see them. Um, and, um, but, but it is something that is definitely needed because as you begin to, to interact with people, you know, and I mean, when I first did child welfare, I didn't have any kids, none whatsoever. And I used to, when people would say, do you have any kids? How do you know how to raise kids? And then after I had twins, I was like, oh, do you have any kids? Because it is so different, right? So it is important for my supervisor who, who had kids to be able to say, look, your, your, your expectations might be too high 
when you don't have any kids, right? There are certain things that a supervisor has to begin to address to get your opinions because there is your personal self, your personal values, but they cannot interfere with your professional values, right? Um, you know, so that is something that I think is real important. Okay, so we have um, Kaylin Cedar Green asked your thoughts on the Violent Against Women's Act, Caden's Law. Caden's is the first child safety federal law that incentivizes states to adopt private child safety legislation to help end our family court crisis. Yeah, uh, Kaylin, I, I'm actually not super um, intimately familiar with federal level state or federal level law, excuse me. I, I think Caden, uh, the Caden law is essentially um, a case where uh, it was a sad case where a child was murdered during an unsupervised visit and it essentially uh, creates a, um, uh, a model for states to adopt, I think, the mandatory evidentiary hearings in case uh, uh, child abuse is documented or risk thereof. And so I'm not intimately familiar with it, but I'm happy to give give you more information if you want to reach out to me. Yeah, I, I um, think states that do things like that are very noble, but sometimes it's because of the law of supply and demand. And we saw what happened to Native Americans where their kids were ripped from them because they were not, they raised their kids from a different cultural perspective. And so that whole uh, law really was to take, to take Native children and place them in white families because there were not a lot of white children available. Um, and, and we did the same thing when, um, you know, a lot of people were going to China and bringing kids over. We're ripping people from families sometimes because of supply and demand. And I firmly believe that the cultural and social experience of one's ethnic group must be paid attention to. Um, and, and so sometimes when states do these things, I always want to go to the data, how many kids were available in that state, and then break it down towards race and age. And generally, you will find that white babies between the area of zero to six months, they just aren't there, you know, because so many people are doing private adoptions and other things. So we find another way of saying, okay, well, we're going to take them over here and put them over there. I, I, I would have to see social workers involved in that because if you go back and look at the Indian child welfare law, you look at a lot of the work that they have done, it is because of laws like that, um, you know, with, where a lot of their families were ripped apart because of cultural factors. Other I, question. I would yeah, yeah I'll, sorry, I'll piggyback because Kaylin had uh, shared that it mandates judges to be informed on domestic violence. My personal position on mandates about trainings um, in relation to justices is, is so it's complicated because I, I, I am fearful of uh, mandates that are uh, ostensibly a checkbox. Um, and, and many professions have that. They maintain that, right? Uh, nowadays, it's a lot of cultural responsiveness or trauma-informed care or, you know, uh, race and ethnicity, that, those sort of checkboxes. And then you can say, yes, I'm, I'm now competent in being anti-racist or whatever the case might be. Um, and so while I do, I strongly believe there's a lot of capacity building for justices. I think they are an extremely um, powerful profession um, that is oftentimes uh, not held accountable. Um, I am absolutely a proponent of mechanisms that create accountability. So yes, absolutely capacity building is important, but I think the, the manner in which we are raising their capacity is extremely pivotal. So if, if, it's, a, if it's a training, you know, it, it, you know, my response would be, it depends. Um, it, if it's embedded in your curricula, as you are moving to a particular profession, I think that is the more, more prudent pathway. And to be frank, there are actually a lot of law schools that are adopting social justice tracks, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. And they're creating pipelines for diverse individuals uh, to enter the profession. And for us uh, with uh, Family Violence Appellate Project, we have a law clerk program um, and you know we're, we're wanting to really expand and deepen the ways in which we are inviting folks who represent uh, marginalized identities to enter the space and do the work 
when you are oftentimes oppressed by these very systems that you're now going to be interfacing with? And what does that look like in terms of your own care, in terms of the ways in which you feel safe and or not safe in the experience? Um, and what does that look like in their sustainability in, in the work? Because it is, it, it's hard work. You know, we're, we're all in the hard work. Right. Um, and so like the, the, the ways in which, so in California, you know, for licensed clinical social workers, it's the board of behavioral sciences that, you know, um, that keeps us accountable, right? They regulate the license and they follow up with any grievances. Um, they're also under-resourced. <laughs> they are so incredibly under-resourced. And like, I, to be honest, I'm pretty sure that this is a trend nationally that mm -hmm. our boards are under-resourced. This is a problem. Mm -hmm. It's a problem not just for our field, it's a problem for other fields that need to be um, held accountable. Uh, that there needs to be uh, an adequate and responsive mechanism for individuals, social workers, clients, community members to file a complaint if they feel a judge has been biased. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yes, one, one sad reality is that, yes, judges are human. The other big sad reality as I delve deeper into this work is that they are, they, they, because they're human, don't retain a lot of the information that they need to. Um, they oftentimes are at bandwidth too. They go case after case after case. Um, and uh, many of them are burnt out as well. And they, you know, oftentimes are not tracking state level policies that, you know, should be informing their decisions. And so it's off the burden often falls onto um, our clients uh, and their, you know, legal representatives to make the case for a particular sort of uh, legislation and or case law. Um, and so all that to say, you know, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of flaw there uh, in the system in and of itself, in the ways in which we resource these systems and personnel to be successful. Um, our courts are inundated. I think we all know that the wait times are ridiculous. The fact that you know people have to go years in these cases, whether it's criminal or civil, is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And none of that's being fixed. You know, at least not anytime soon. And, um, and a, a big thing, I think, you know, I also want to name because social workers have, um, could potentially have a hand in, um, I'm sorry, I'm going off on a little bit of a, a pedestal, but um, social workers have a hand in changing is that uh, a lot of, um, in the state of California, survivors have the right to uh, request a free court reporter so that they have documentation of their uh, court proceedings. Um, I, this isn't the case for most states in the nation. Uh, but that said, you know, a lot of times, survivors will uh, will bypass that because there isn't a court reporter, because there's a workforce shortage. Mm -hmm. And so what happens then is that there, um, there is not um, a, a permanent written verbatim record of what happened. And then it falls onto the human judge to recall what happened. Um, and so that, that in and of itself, again, is a flaw because the court hasn't addressed that issue. Um, in California, we have a bill that where we are advocating for um, the allowance of electronic recording because that will help, um, you know, fill a gap in, in that you don't need, you know, the workforce augmentation, but there is a resource that's readily available and has been increasingly available during COVID. Um, but all that to say, you know, there there's so much room for improvement in the judicial system, uh, just as much as any other, like the healthcare system, I can make a case about, you know, child welfare systems, behavioral health, all of it. Um, and uh, and we as social workers, I think, you know, um, should have the resources to be able to file grievances when we see them, should be able to, you know, um, it, yeah, have a mechanism for uh, advocating for the change. Mm -hmm. And I think and I think those are bigger conversations that certainly NSW has been a part of and, and um, I'm sure will continue to be a part of. Yeah. Well, you know, what you said was that um, social workers have to be realistic. The resources are are not as plentiful as we think they are to improve systems, and so what happens? The status quo remains, and uh, even the status quo, there's not enough resources for that as well. So, where do we go? Where how do we rise up? Like uh, Andrea Day says, you know, the, the 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 part is we can be angry and point fingers and say it's your job or we can get in there. And this is why I think it's so critical that social workers understand that part of your role is to build coalitions with other partners, right? So that you can kind of understand the legal system. No one's asking you to become a lawyer, but what we're saying is you need to understand the legal system. You need to understand the medical system. 
right? Uh, your child ends up in the hospital because of abuse. You need to understand how to navigate those waters. Uh, we hadn't even touched upon institutional abuse of children or foster parents abuse of, of children. We haven't talked about, um, you know, settlements can, you know, if a child is abused, do they have the right if they want a case where they are to receive some remunerations because of that? All of those things are what we see in our utopia, that perfect world. But we're not living in there. But there's nothing to say that we can't build coalitions that will bring us further and further closer to equity. You know, our field has been talking about defunding child welfare for a long period of time. It was talked about when I graduated with my degree. Does the system really work? Is the system will perpetuate? Uh, there was the movie Claudine way back where a child was, just didn't talk. Uh, fathers couldn't be in the household if they needed to get a check, they had to leave. There were a lot of things that were wrong in that welfare system at the very beginning. And, and, and you know, even our founder, Jane Addams, was complicit in some of that stuff. So, so we have to uh, kind of understand that we have evolved, but there ain't no stopping us now. You know, we, we, we can't, you know, I mean, I often say that about NASW when people will call me and say, you need to do such and such. And I'm like, okay, so tell me what you did so I can build upon that right? Because I'm just one person. So tell me what you did and we can build upon it or we can build a coalition or develop a concept paper. That is how we're going to bring about change. And this appellate process, you know, we, 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 we're talking about that today because you know that there are in a lot of states the right for people to have bail. You know, we know that people get out on the streets who have money and sit in jail for two or three years who do not and cannot pay that bail. Sometimes because of the innocent project that we work with, with Brian Stevenson, um, those individuals are innocent. So could we go to Brian Stevenson and say, here's another project for you. Are you interested? We have to sell what is needed for the system to get better. We have to do the research there's no question that the child welfare system is flawed in many ways. But as Deborah said earlier, I'm not going to take her words. There's no perfect system. If you tell me a perfect system, I will give you $100 right now here today. I'll send it to you in the mail. There's no perfect system. All systems are flawed. But how do we get into the middle and begin to push it over so that it has become more equitable? Um, and I think the voices that rise um, for the defund the child welfare, they're voices we have to embrace, ideologies we have to embrace. Um, and if there's those that say, don't touch child welfare. Well, status quo never takes you into the future. You know, if we maintain the way things are gone, we'll always live in the past. So, Deborah, I know um, we talked a little bit about it. I, I, I have problems when people say you're either for or against, because um, in my world, I like to hear the research. I like to hear to talk to the people who are actually affected to get their opinion of what is needed. So, Deborah, tell us uh, as we're getting ready to close in a few, because we told you this time will go. And if anybody has a final question, post it up and we'll get it up. This, this thing that we're in, like you say, you're working in an oppressive system. You understand that. You know, we all understand that when we take a job. You, you take, I mean, I, I literally talk about people that work in the academy. You want to talk about an oppressive system, the ivory tower and tenure and promotion and what you're allowed to write about. Oh, my God, that's the most oppressive system that we have. But it's there. And you see a lot of people throwing up their banners and celebrating. So, Deborah, tell us, tell us what your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I I would validate that it's a harmful system. It, it is, absolutely. There's no arguments about it. There's harm done, there was harm done, there's harm continuously done, and there are biased people within the system. There are systemic structures that are largely flawed. Um, there are policies that are largely flawed. And again, you know, I spoke to this earlier, they're blanketed approaches. They're all, you know, for the most part, they, you have these blanketed sort of um, white centric uh, models of doing the work that have sort of uh, perpetuated in these systems. And it's, and while there there are conversations about change, it's not happening fast enough. Um, and and all of that's absolutely true. And I think social workers 
also are the best position to inform what next. And I think that that essentially is our, our call in these upcoming years to help define, you know, with folks like NASW, define what exactly does that look like moving forward to have, um, you know, uh, a system or maybe even system isn't the right word, but, but a something that embraces love and, and centers human humanness and human beings in the ways in which we are resourced and interface with other humans. Um, and, you know, right now, that's what the folks in first response are grappling with. And folks are piloting models and they're gathering data and they're, you know, testing things out in the community. And I think all of that's amazing. And I think all of that needs to be learned from. And I think we have an opportunity if for any of you who are positioned at, at your, you know, institutions to, to impact that change. I think that is a call out for us to to uh, step into it and lean into it. Certainly, you know, uh, I myself as well, my organization would love to be a part of that conversation, whatever your community is, because we are actively in those conversations as well, because it's not working. It's not working. Our kids are being harmed. Our families are being harmed. Um, and and we need we need and can do better. And so um, those conversations absolutely have merit. And, you know, we all need to talk about what this what this next iteration looks like. Yeah, I always say that when you go to social work conferences, you, I kind of go, I'll, I'll go because you're presenting, right? And I'll go, but I think even the conference model is outdated. Oh, yes. I, I would love yeah. to have innovative conversations um, to really kind of talk about what next to hear people who have yeah. two sides of the coin, right? Because yeah. the, it, it, it makes you think you need to talk to both people. I don't want to be yelling at you. I don't want to be arguing with you. I don't want to see you on Twitter for five words. I want you to come and let's talk about how we can do this together because we're all here. But uh, the conference model that we spend thousands of dollars of going to a conference, of going to a session that has an abstract review to help somebody so they can either get a promotion or whatever. It's outdated people. You know, how do we go to meetings where we're meeting and we're talking and we're building and we're coming up with ideas that we will all take and begin to implement? I, until we start doing things different, we're just going to keep saying, should child welfare, da 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 we'll have the same type of sessions, and, um, and it's just not child welfare. I don't want to just beat on that. It's the prison system. It's every system that we're involved in. And so social work has to kind of change it up. You know, our regular conference things, you know, that doesn't work all the time. You know, yeah. we, we, there are a lot of people and many people who are graduating that are new and they want to come and they want to hear what has worked and what hasn't worked. And I want to hear what they're thinking, their new books, right, that they've written and they've, that's what's going to get us on the path. So don't engage in those Twitter wars. Don't engage in my neighborhood wars. Engage in talking with people about, I see it differently. Look, tell me how you see it. And how is this going to be beneficial? Deborah, I'll give you a few minutes to close at your response. I told you this time would go fast. We could probably be on here for another <laughs> hour. Uh, and I thank our listening audience as well. Go ahead, Deborah. Yeah, no, I think I just want to express my appreciation. Um, it, you know, it was it was a joy to be able to talk about my work, although, you know, I'm, I'm new-ish in it. Um, you know, I think I've learned so much about the ways in which we can leverage systems against themselves. And, you know, to be honest, it's also hard to be work, choosing to work with such a harmful system and to kind of uh, live and breathe, uh, you know, with that and in that. Um, and I think that is a reality that many of us, um, uh, you know, choose to be in. And I think it's absolutely okay for us to acknowledge that uh, it is hard. It is hard to choose to work within these systems and to navigate them and to try to find fixes that oftentimes don't feel fixable. Um, and, you know, and yes, we need to make sure that we take care of ourselves, but we also need to make sure our systems and organizations take care of us too. And so that is absolutely something we should demand and the NASW should continue to demand and that we have the right to um, and to also be okay with periodically, you know, working outside of systems and outside of, you know, these spaces that are more institutionalized and doing what feels right for you because we need it all. We need social workers in all, all right. these spaces. And certainly, you know, being a social worker leading a legal aid organization has been a novel thing for me. 
And if we don't see a social worker in this space, you know, you all can absolutely be that social worker. And I think we need more of that. We need more, um, more of you all in these, uh, in these variety of spaces, leading these organizations, um, you know, being in a space where you can translate your lived experience as direct service providers and their lived experience in your personal lives um, into uh, these larger systemic changes. And I, I love seeing, you know, all the, the sort of activity in the chat as you all were sharing what you're doing in your own communities and learning and and uh, also reflections because um, because you know Dr. Joyner is right we we need to actualize this um, and it's not going to happen um, you know overnight and it's not certainly going to happen you know just in conversation but it needs to happen um, and we need to call out our systems and and to be frank you know I think I think NASW I'm going to lovingly and gently call call uh, you all in in that I do think we need to litigate. I do think we need to start, you know, thinking about avenues to push systems harder, um, to to sue systems when they harm social workers, to to you know to really um, to truly leverage them against themselves, and uh, and it's something that uh, that unfortunately you know we we have to come out strongly in. And yes, conversation is great, and you know let's let's all find a way to act too. And I think um, yeah, I'm here with you to to support that. We should be suing Florida, Texas. I mean, I mean, to be real quiet, be honest. Yes, I think all of those things are important and why membership matters and why we need your um, your voice and your ideas because, you know, we are living in difficult times and people, there are a select group of people making decisions for all Americans across the United States. Um, I, I can't say that anymore than the truth. Just, just, you know, just look at yesterday's headlines of who was arrested and for what counts and, and yet the political power they still have. Um, it, it is, um, it's a mockery of our system, but those who are falling victim are the people that we are charged in our code of ethics to protect the most vulnerable people who are very rarely heard. And so the one thing that I say, if you're, if you get a job in social work, as far as a child welfare, use your credentials. But if you get a job at legal aid, use your credentials. The more that people see social workers are everywhere, there's over 850,000 social workers, the more impact we have. Be like, wow, I didn't know you were a social worker. And far too often when we go to another system, and I heard somebody say, well, you know, I was a so I, I, I was in a, in a hospital setting and this poor girl said, I was a social worker, but I'm not anymore. And I'm like, you are always a social worker. You might have your RM, but you've got your MSW, put it together. And, be, and she said, you know, I never really thought about it because the skills that I use, I usually rely more on my social work skills. So this is really a different type of system. The one thing that I want to say to all of the grads that are there who are beginning to put their applications in for jobs, don't always do those traditional things. Go somewhere where it might uh, be a little bit different. And if you say, well, then how am I going to get my direction? Develop your own um, little seminar group, a group of friends that you graduate, that you check in once a month to say, hey, how do I deal with this? Because talking with other colleagues is really going to help motivate you. Deborah, thanks so much for the work that you're doing. I hope that we get other people who say, wow, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go into legal aid and I'm going to be the social worker there um, because it's needed. Thank you so much. Thank you, listening audience. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.